One of the most watched events on TV every year is the Super Bowl. But as you know, there are some that watch it not to see the game, but to see what kind of commercials are going to come on while it's going on. Because you see sometimes the best and, well, sometimes the worst of advertising. But many times you see some of the funniest commercials all year long from all of the different companies. But if we're being honest, which commercials are always the funniest? It's the beer commercials. They always have ways of making us laugh. And, but as we look at the, the message that's communicated through them, it's that if you use our product, you'll have a good time. The commercials show that co-workers and friends and family all participate in this together. And if you want to fit in, that's what everyone else is doing. And it's portrayed as something you do as just a, a common social thing that's not a big deal. Everybody does it. But is the message they portray in those commercials and advertisements, is it really true? Is it really not a big deal to engage in that? Well, as we continue to look at the concept of wisdom out of the book of Proverbs, <laughs> there we go. We'll be looking at what the Bible has to say about indulging in alcohol. But as we begin to do that, as we consider what does the Bible have to say about this, I think it's important that we do a little bit of background study, that we take a look at just what exactly does the Bible mean whenever it uses that term wine, because that, ver that word is used throughout Scripture. But it doesn't always mean exactly the same thing, depending on context. And so it's important for us as we consider that before we get into looking at the message of it, just what is it? What does it mean? And so we have to define terms in the correct way. And the word wine means something to us as we consider what is wine. In our 21st century understanding, it's something that you would buy at a liquor store. It's something that, uh, that could be intoxicating. But does it really always have that same definition biblically? How is it used in the Bible? Now the word wine is not just a simple term in Scripture. It's translated from multiple different words. And we're going to look at a couple of the most common. And, and if you'll stay with me for just a minute, we're not going to get too complicated with this, but simply to make a specific point. Wine is a generic term in the Bible. It can mean either intoxicating, fermented juice, or it can mean what we would think of today as like Welch's grape juice. And you have to use context in order to understand just exactly what's going on. And I'll give you an example. In the scripture that was read just a moment ago, in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker and strong drink a brawler. Whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. Now obviously the context there tells us that's speaking about intoxicating drink. The term there that's used in the Hebrew, yayin, is the word translated as wine. And in this context, it's speaking of something that is intoxicating. However, in another context, if you go to Isaiah chapter 16 and verse 10, that same term comes up, but it's used in a very different way. It says, gladness and joy are taken away from the fruitful field. In the vineyards also there will be no cries of joy or jubilant shouting, nor treader, <clears throat> no treader treads out wine in the presses. He's talking about the juice that comes from a grape whenever it's crushed. But it's the same term that's used there. Context has to tell us, what's it talking about? And so it's a generic term that we have to understand. We have to use some discernment to, to, to understand just exactly what's going on here. There's another term that we see in Isaiah 65, a different Hebrew term that is translated as wine. And like I said, we're not going to get too... Try to not get too complicated in all of this, but just simply to, to lay a foundation before we get into seeing what is the message of Scripture on this. In Isaiah 65, in verse 8, Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, Do not destroy it, for there is benefit in it. So I'll act on behalf of my servants in order not to destroy all of them. Well, he talks about new wine that's in the cluster. And he uses the Greek word tirosh, which simply is talking about, and generally speaking, is about unfermented product or juice from a grape. 
Now, there is one instance where the, where the meaning of that is debated, but as you look throughout Scripture, that term is generally used of what we would think of as Welch's grape juice. But yet again, it's translated in many cases in the same way as that other word, wine. We have to use context. We have to use some discernment to understand what is Scripture talking about. We see the same generic term or, or the same concept in the New Testament where wine is a generic term. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 17, Jesus uses the term for wine there, oinos. That is the main term translated as wine in the New Testament. And he says, people do not put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. When he talks there about the new wine, he's talking about unfermented produce from a grape, the unfermented juice that comes from a grape. It's put into a new wine skin because the older ones would be, as they age, they would be brittle and the pressure that's created within the skin from the fermentation process would cause it to break. And so whenever a, the unfermented juice was stored, it would be put into a new wine skin. However, the passage that we looked at earlier, Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk with wine. That's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. It's the same term. Oinos. We have to use context to tell us. And the whole point of that being is that we use context to determine what is being talked about when the word wine comes up. Is it alcoholic or non-alcoholic? We cannot insert simply our 21st century understanding because when we use the word wine today, that's very different than grape juice. We have to understand the context. And we understand that whenever we look at the word love, both in the Bible, or also in the way that we use it today. You know, I might say that I love a good hamburger. That means something very different than saying, I love my children. We understand the context. Those, that word, although it's the same word, it means something very different in those two sentences. And as we understand, as we look at this term wine in the Bible, we have to understand context. Look at what it's talking about. And so as we continue on from that, so what does the Bible have to say about it? There are plenty of warnings throughout Scripture about the use of alcohol. One that was read earlier, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, Wine is a mocker, beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. We see alcohol being personified in this passage as a mocker, as a brawler, one that promises one thing but delivers another. Whenever we look at the, the advertisements for beer on TV, we see it promises a good time. This is an essential part of a group of friends going out to have a good time, but how many lives have been destroyed by it? It promises fun. It promises enjoyment. It promises pleasure. But in so many cases, it brings nothing but addiction and pain and suffering and heartache. And we see Scripture personifying it as such. It causes damage as if it were mocking or fighting against those who consume it. Intoxication, the New American Standard says, is not wise. Another version says, whoever is led astray by it is not wise. We have to be careful that we don't allow addictive substances, particularly in our context today, alcohol to lead us astray, to lead us away from living as God would have us to. But I'd like to call your attention to Proverbs chapter 23. And we're going to look in verses 29 to 35. Because we have one of the I believe one of the clearest passages on the, on the use of alcohol in Scripture. Verse 29, he starts off, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? He begins by asking some questions. In effect, the author here is saying, Who do you know that has problems? 
And he's getting ready to answer that question. These are not rhetorical questions. He's setting the stage for what he's getting ready to say next. Here are all kinds of issues that you see with what he's getting ready to talk about. Verse 30, those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine, do not gaze at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights. Your mind will imagine confusing things. You'll be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? We see the destruction of alcohol coming through in this passage, the issues with it. Who has all of these problems? He says, the one who lingers over it. The one who is enticed by it. But he talks about the end result. He said, here's what's going to happen. It's going to be as if you were bitten by a snake. He talks about the hallucinations. He talks about the effects of drunkenness. You'll see things that aren't there. There's instability. And as we look around at our culture today, we see the problems that it causes that it ruins marriages, hurts children, wastes household resources. We see problems within families from it. In 2015, according to the CDC, there were 10,265 traffic-related deaths as a result of alcohol. That is 29% in that year, 29% of all traffic-related fatalities were the result of alcohol. Nearly a third. That alone should be enough to motivate us to stay away from it. Because of the problems that it causes, it destroys careers, it causes unplanned pregnancies, all sorts of health problems. And as we look around, there are the 12-step programs like Alcoholics Anonymous, an entire organization devoted to help undo the damage that alcohol has done. We see the effects of it in culture all around us. And as we see the last verse in this passage we've just read in Proverbs 23, the way that it controls those who, are, uh, who get themselves involved in it. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. The one who has sorrow, the one who has woe, the one who's seen all of these strange things, the one who says they beat me up and I didn't know it, the one who has all of these issues. Notice what it says at the very end, the very last thing. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? The one who's been hurt by it's just going after more and more and more and it shows the way that it's addictive. It controls, it leads us astray. What a powerful warning against something that Satan has used to destroy so many. But we may ask, what's really the big deal after all? I mean, we might, we might want to argue, well, you know, I can handle myself around it just fine. It doesn't really bother me. It bothers other people. It doesn't bother me, we might argue. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at a couple of different passages here. Galatians 5. We'll begin reading in verse 19. Uh, excuse me, verse 19. It says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The overindulgence, the drunkenness, Paul is very clear that kind of lifestyle does not lead to being in the presence of God, does not lead to the kingdom of God. However, on the other hand, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. 
Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Often what we see of those who partake is a loss of self-control, and many times the line there, they don't realize they've lost control until it's too late. I'm just fine to drive home until they weren't. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control with the direct result of indulging in too much alcohol is a loss of self-control. Drunkenness is a work of the flesh. The Lord calls us to be people who have control over ourselves. What's the big deal? It can cause us to lose control. But I want to call our attention to another passage as well. Let's go to Romans chapter 14. As we consider, why is this such a big deal? In Romans chapter 14, verses 19 and following, in this chapter, Paul is talking about some things that were debated among the, uh, in the church. And he says there, So then we are to pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things are uh, indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The point being, how are we influencing others with our behavior? It becomes a big deal when we lose control. It also becomes a big deal when we influence someone else in a way that leads them away from the Lord. And I'm not talking about just in the here and the now, but when someone sees us engaging in such behavior, taking a drink of something that we shouldn't, how will that affect a child who sees a parent doing it, who sees a grandparent doing it, who thinks, well, that's no big deal. I can do that whenever I get older. You may be able to handle it, but can they? Are we unwittingly putting a stumbling block in front of the next generation? in front of a new Christian? Are we putting something there that's going to cause them to lose control, that would cause them to lose their soul, to cause them to turn away from the Lord and live different from His ways? We can cause a stumbling block without even realizing it. And as we've already seen, and Paul says as well to the Corinthians, those who live this kind of lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of God. You might ask the question, well, who defines drunkenness anyway? I mean, after all, if you look at you know, the way that they measure that with the different tests, the, the blood tests and the breath tests and things, there's this range. Well, you know, I can control myself up to a certain point. But who defines it? Well, if you're driving, the government does. And it is possible to be drunk while thinking that you really aren't. To be out of control while under the delusion that you're still in control. But the question that many are tempted to ask, how far is too far? Think about that. How far is too far? Because I would suggest to you that if that's the question we're asking, how far is too far? then our perspective has been skewed. That's the wrong question to ask. How can I best glorify the Lord and influence people to follow Him? What do I need to do to avoid putting a stumbling block in front of a brother or sister? How can my life be the most like Jesus? Because you see, regardless of what temptation we're talking about, whether we're talking about alcohol or anything else, when we ask how far is too far, how close can I get to sin without stepping into it, is very dangerous territory. As we read the warnings over and over again in Scripture about it, the wise thing to do would be to avoid it altogether. You see, I've got two reasons 
that it's not allowed in my house at all. Number one is because I know that if I don't take the first drink, I will never be addicted to it. But number two, my children are watching. And even if I were to take a drink, even if I could handle it, I have four children. Which one of them might not? And I have no desire to give Satan an opportunity. He has plenty of areas that he tempts me already. I don't want another one. Proverbs 23, verses 29 and following. Who has problems? Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger over wine. Those who go to taste mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. Your mind will utter perverse things. You'll be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea or one who lies down on top of a mast. They struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I did not know it. When shall I awake? I'll seek another drink. To avoid all of those problems, we can just simply avoid the source. To not indulge. In just a moment, we're going to offer an invitation and we invite you to do just exactly what Paul charged the, uh, the Ephesians to do. Don't get drunk with wine. That's dissipation. Another version says that leads to debauchery. We see that in the culture all around us, but rather be filled with the Spirit. Let's be those people who are led by, who are influenced by, who live not under the influence of things that would take control of us, that would cause us to lose control of what we're doing and do things that people might would say we've lost our mind. Let's live under the influence of our Lord and His Spirit who lives within us. Let's be under His control, under His influence. Sin enslaves. But as we see through Scripture, Christ offers freedom. Have you been enslaved to sin? Have you been struggling with whether it be alcohol or some other addictive behavior or something else that you're struggling to let go of? We invite you right now. We will pray with you. We'll help you find whatever help you need in it. If you'll let us know. Or this morning, if you need to commit yourself to following the Lord, if you've never become a child of God, you can choose to turn away from sin right now. Confess belief in Him as the Son of God who died and buried and rose again and be united with Him in the waters of baptism and come up free from sin. If we can assist you in any way this morning, would you come while we stand and while we sing?